to welcome Cynthia Farahat, who's a writing fellow at the Middle East Forum and a founder of uh, the Egyptian Liberal Party, the first secular classical liberal political party in the history of modern Egypt. Uh, she co-authored Desecration of a Heavenly Religion, which analyzed and criticized Egypt's blasphemy law. The, the, this is something about which she is to be congratulated as the book was officially banned <laughs> by none other than Al-Azhar University, that center of regression in the Arab world. Uh, also, her work on countering Islamic terrorism uh, led the Leban Lebanese intelligence officials to bar her from entering that country. Uh, as a result of her work, she's received uh, multiple death threats, uh, made the Al-Qaeda death list. Uh, unfortunately, in Egypt, her brother was abducted a friend assassinated, and other threats on her life led her to flee to the United States, where she was given uh, political asylum. She is currently writing a book on the Muslim Brotherhood's involvement in transnational terrorism. Uh, she's written multiple articles in, in both English and Arabic for National Review, uh, Middle East Quarterly, and other publications. Tonight she'll speak on the subject, is the Muslim Brotherhood still a threat today? Welcome, Cynthia. Well, thank you so much for having me, and thank you for the wonderful introduction, Robert. Uh, I, it's, it's usually better than the introductions that I used to receive in Egypt. <laughs> Once during a debate with the Muslim Brotherhood operative, I was introduced as the firewood of hell, Cynthia Farahat. <laughs> so this is pretty flattering, you know? So, so they're, they're not very good at talking to women. It's not the strongest um, attribute. And today's talk is, is particularly special uh, to me because I've had uh, a year off from my work because uh, I was dealing with a big C. And um, I am, I'm doing so much better now. And um, to the Muslim Brotherhood, to my stalkers who are watching this, I don't want you to... Uh, enjoy it or celebrate it because in 2006 I uh, vowed during the discussion with the Muslim Brotherhood member of parliament and leader Sophie Saleh that I will continue to fight them as long as I live and from beyond the grave. So it's actually going to be worse if I die. I have a network set up and everything is there. So um, first I'd like to uh, point out a clear distinction between uh, Muslims and the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood have always strived to hijack representation of Muslims and speak on behalf of Muslims. And the truth is the vast majority of my allies and the strongest and the fiercest of them against this terrorist group are Muslims. My biggest supporters, my biggest fans are Muslims. So that is a clear, clear distinction. The title of the talk today is The Muslim Brotherhood Still a Threat is intended to demonstrate how dire the situation is. Because if academia and the media we're doing the job, we would know the correct answer to that question. But unfortunately, this is not the case. And the problem goes beyond that. that it's just not just a problem of inaccurate information. The American people are targets of misinformation and disinformation. For instance, former director of national intelligence, James Clapper, incredibly described the organization as largely secular. While Islamist apologist John Esposito of Georgetown University 
claimed that the Muslim Brotherhood affiliated movements and parties have been a force for dem democratization and stability in the Middle East. Esp Esposito calls the incubator of modern terrorism <laughs> and, uh, and its affiliated groups such as ISIS and Al-Qaeda forces for democratization and stability in the Middle East. And this is the person who's teaching your children and your future leaders about Islamic terrorism and the Middle East. Before I get into the discussion about it, I would like to point out that there's going to be a lot of historic background. And we absolutely need to discuss history when we discuss the Middle East because and, and Islamic terrorism. It's impossible to understand it out of its, its historic context. Just as a doctor does not treat a symptom uh, or diagnose an ailment without taking into account the patient's medical history. It's just as critical also to be able to analyze and predict the course of Sunni Islamic terrorism, such as the Muslim Brotherhood. First, history protects from repeating the same mistakes, and it also helps us identify behavioral patterns, trends, and tendencies of these groups and their agent to preemptively try to stop them. Second, it is a fact that Islamists believe that it is a religious cultist duty to reincarnate and regurgitate almost everything in early Islamic history, from the wardrobe, from the facial hair, the eating habits, and of course, early wars and jihad. <coughs> According to the fundamentalist Sunni Orthodox Hanbali School of Jurisprudence, which is adhered to by the Muslim Brotherhood and the vast majority, if not all, Sunni terrorist groups, it is a mandatory religious obligation to engage in what they call theologically dawam al jihad, which is the permanence of jihad. This is why the Muslim Brotherhood is religiously obligated to engage in terrorism, which they have unleashed upon the world for a century. The founder of the Muslim Brotherhood is Hassan al-Banna. From an early age, he was only 12 years old in 1918, and he started to engage in antisocial criminal behavior. He uh, while studying at an Islamic madrasa, he founded a group called the Vice Prevention. And this lovely group used to uh, write threatening letters and death threats to Muslims who are not uh, religious enough, to women who wear makeup and Western clothes. Uh, they used, uh, they, they, at one point, uh, little uh, pyromaniac Hassan Albana set uh, Christian properties on fire. Just a lovely young man. And it, es it only escalated and got worse from, that, from this point. Uh, this also explains that he was, uh, his upbringing, his father uh, was a very religious man and he indoctrinated him and his children in the Hanbali Orthodox uh, School of Jurisprudence. He engaged in a lot of activism until he founded the Muslim Brotherhood in 1928 in Osmaleya city in Northeast Egypt. Now, this is fun, okay? During the early founding of the organization, Brotherhood leaders were intrigued by the secret Shia theology known as al batiniya which means inner esoteric or hidden theology. This theology was adopted by the Hashishin, the assassins, 
the murderous medieval Shia Ismaili cult in the late 11th century. According to the Brotherhood co-founder Ali al Ashmawi, the assassins were the biggest influence on the formation of the group. The Muslim Brotherhood was indeed a project to revive the assassins. This is what we're dealing with today. The word assassins is from the medieval Latin assassinus from Arabic hashishin. So it shouldn't be as a surprise that in 1936, Hassan al-Banna and his uh, group uh, decides to found what they call the secret apparatus or the special apparatus. And this group was mainly concerned with uh, ter terrorism and clandestine activities. Interestingly, the terror apparatus soon became an ally of Adolf Hitler. And Hitler's regime was among the donors that funded Hassan al-Banna. And Banna uh, repaid the favor by glorifying Hitler in 1938. Uh, there was an article that Banna written in the Muslim newspaper called Al-Nazir, where he said that Hajj Muhammad Hitler converted to Islam. And shortly after, the Muslim Brotherhood went out chanting in the streets, Allah Hai, Allah Hai, Al Hajj Muhammad Hitler Gay, which means God is alive, God is alive, Hajj Muhammad Hitler is coming. This is, I'd like to make a side note here, because before Hajj Muhammad Hitler, there was another Western Hajj as well. In 1898, 40 years pr pr prior to Hajj Hitler, the Kaiser Wilhelm II gave a speech in Damascus at the tomb of Saladin <laughs> proclaiming himself a friend of Islam. And a decade later, he was known as Hajj Wilhelm. And 111 years later, in 2009, there was another individual who was known in the Arabic blogosphere as Hajj Barack Obama after he gave a similar speech in Cairo University in 2009. Shows you how history is <laughs> just repeating itself. Well, the Muslim Brotherhood secret apparatus, of course, perpetrated horrific crimes and attacks in Egypt. Few of them are, in 1946, they bombed eight police station in Cairo. They also did the same thing, the same apparatus, which is still functional, by the way, did the same thing in 2012 and 2013. They burned numerous police station including horrific torture and murder of several police officers, and it was so gruesome that they even forced them to drink acid. In 1947, the Brotherhood secret apparatus assassinated Judge Ahmed Khazandar Bey, and in 2015, the same apparatus assassinated Prosecutor General of Egypt, Hisham Barakat. In 1945, they perpetrated a wave of bombings, such as the 1945 bombings of the British Club in Egypt. In recent decades, they perpetrated countless of bombing attacks, including the bombing in front of a cancer center in Cairo in 2019. In 1948, the Brotherhood bombed several Jewish homes in Cairo and many Jewish owned businesses in cinemas and in 2012 and 2013 they burnt over 70 churches in Egypt. 
and some American experts will tell you that the secret apparatus doesn't exist. It's a thing of the past. The wave of terror that the early uh, operatives of this apparatus perpetrated upon Egypt resulted in the 1949 assassination of Hassan al-Banna. And the yeah. next stage uh, is focused of the, the infiltration activity and the subversive activities of the apparatus, which is still ongoing till today across the world, including in the United States of America. The secret apparatus was able to infiltrate a group of officers from the Egyptian military. Among them was the future president, Gamal Abdel Nasser, who uh, vowed, uh, who gave the Pledge of Allegiance to Hassan al-Banna on the Ghanan Quran. And he soon joined the secret apparatus and had his own, formed his own unit called the Batil Ikhwan, or the Brotherhood Officers. They kept operating until 1950, after all the terrorism, Egypt basically hated the Muslim Brotherhood, so he decided to change the name of the unit to the Free Officers instead of the Brotherhood Officers. And two years later, he perpetrated the 1952 socialist Islamic military coup on Egypt, which turned it from one of the freest and tolerant countries in the Middle East at the time to what we see today. But something else happened after Nasser took power in 1952. Although he came out of the Brotherhood, there was some disagreements and some issues, and he asked the Muslim Brotherhood to dismantle the secret apparatus. They weren't very keen on doing so, but the next, uh, the uh, Hassan al banas successor, uh, al-Hudaybi, Hassan al-Hudaybi, decided to perform taqiyya, dissimulation and say that they have indeed dismantled the secret apparatus. At the same time, they were plotting to assassinate Nasser. Typical. And they formed a terrorist group in 1965 called Tanzim Khamsa Sitin, which is the organization of 65. And they attempted to kill Gamal Abdel Nasser the same year, which of course resulted in um, the execution of the Brotherhood's foremost ideologue, Sayyid Qutb, in 1966 with two other leaders. Hudayli Staqiya, to deny the existence of secret apparatus, became a strategy that the Muslim Brotherhood is still practicing till today. And not only that, they started to franchise terror under different banners. For instance, they, uh, the international apparatus was led by uh, Banna's son-in-law, Saeed Ramadan, who moved to Geneva in 1958 and where he established the international apparatus under the guidance of the secret apparatus leader, Mustafa Mashhur, and who later became the general guide. And by the way, Saeed Ramadan is the father of Islamist agitator Tariq Ramadan. In the 1960s and early 70s, the Brotherhood formed several groups under different banners. The first of these groups was Jama'at al-Muslimin, commonly known as Takfir al-Hijra, which is excommunication and immigration, uh, which was formed by leaders of the secret apparatus. They also founded Al-Jama'a al-Islamiyya, or GI, which was responsible for the October 1981 assassination of Egyptian President Anwar Sadat. And one of Sadat's assassins was Abu Dazumar, 
who was an officer in Egyptian in military intelligence. Again, the infiltration. The international apparatus wasn't fully operative until the mid-1980s, when the head of the secret apparatus, Mustafa Mashur, settled in Germany in 1986, where he re-established the apparatus under the guidance of GI leader Omar Abdurrahman, also known as the Blind Sheikh. And he ordered Omar Abdurrahman to, re to relocate to the United States. Omar Abdurrahman was also Osama bin Laden's mentor, and in my personal opinion, he is the most important terror theologian of the century. So you might wonder how an international terrorist like Rahman was allowed to enter and live in the United States, right? Rahman was issued a, terrorist, a, a tourist visa to visit the United States by the consulate of the United States Embassy in Khartoum in Sudan, despite his name being on the list of U.S. State Department terrorist watch list. Rahman was allowed to enter the United States in July 1990. The State Department then revoked his tourist visa in November, in 17 November of the same year. Despite this, in 1991, he obtained a green card from the Immigration and Naturalization <laughs> Services Office in Newark, New Jersey. I've got a serious problem in Newark, New Jersey, by the way. <laughs> serious. <laughs> Bad stuff. You'll see later. It's the stuff of nightmares. In 1992, the U.S. government revoked his green card, which was, but it only allowed him to apply for asylum afterwards. And then, of course, during that time, he was allowed to roam the United States freely and declared fatwas to, and stated that it was lawful to rob banks and kill Jews in the U.S. His sermons condemned Americans as descendants of apes and pigs who have been feeding from the dining tables of Zionists, communists, and colonialists. These are his words. He also urged Muslim Americans to cut the transportation of their countries, tear it apart, destroy their economy, burn their companies, eliminate their interest, sink their ships, shoot down their planes, kill them on the sea, on sea, air, or land. Rahman was still allowed to preach in three mosques in New York City, and his devout followers including a person, included a person who was responsible for the 1993 World Trade Center bombing in October, 1955, he was convicted of sedition, this seditious conspiracy, solicitation to murder Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak, conspiracy to, to, to commit murder against the president, uh, president Hosni Mubarak, solicitation, uh, solicitation to attack the U.S. military installations and conspiracy to conduct bombings. In 1996, he was sent sentenced to life in solitary confinement without parole until he died in 19, sorry, in 2017. Well, similar, similar failures have happened that allowed the 19 terrorists to perpetrate and come to this country and then ultimately perpetrate 9-11. The international apparatus, though, the most critical mission was the founding of Al-Qaeda. And, but it's not only the violent jihad. Uh, they also have another critical um, mission, which is to subvert and infiltrate and destroy 
uh, American and Western institutions from within, such as the media, uh, such as education systems uh, and academia, y you name it, they're there. And they call this process which means civilization jihad operation. This term dates to a 1991 document titled the Explanatory Memorandum drafted in a meeting that outlined the Muslim Brotherhood's strategic goals for North America and it was entered into evidence in the Holy Land Foundation trial in 2008 and that was the largest terror financing trial in the history of America. And in 2009, five Muslim Brotherhood leaders were charged with providing material support to Hamas and Brotherhood Palestinian branch, the Brotherhood Palestinian branch and a designated foreign terrorist organization in the United States. It's also important to mention that the Council on American Islamic Relations, CARE, was an unindicted co-conspirator in this case. And in 2017, for their wonderful work, they were rewarded a DHS uh, grant, $100,000 grant from taxpayers' money. All this was not, if this is not enough, the Muslim Brotherhood also founded Al-Qaeda. In the early 1980s, uh, Maktab al-Khadamat, which is M-A-K, uh, the service bureau, also known as the service bureau of Arab jihadists, flocked to Afghanistan and Pakistan to fight the Soviet occupation, and the Brotherhood was busy recruiting jihadists, uh, jihadists through the service of MAK offices throughout the Middle East. And in 1984, Brotherhood operative Abdullah Azam established the MAK office in Jordan, and Azam's leader position in the Brotherhood's international apparatus helped establish what the Brotherhood called global G the Global Jihad Movement and earned him the alias, the father of global jihad. Mm -hmm. And Osama bin Laden was also Azam's student in Saudi Arabia. In 1985, Azam bin Laden and Ayman al-Zawahri, the leader of Takfir wal Hijra, founded the MAK office in Pakistan, which later officially evolved to become Al-Qaeda. Meanwhile, the Amman MAK office was busy recruiting mass murderers, psychopaths, serial killers, and terrorists. Among them was Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, the man who decapitated Nick Berg in 2004 uh, on video. He was the one who started the gruesome trend of video decapitation. He was recruited by the Muslim Brotherhood, the force of modernization and democratization. So, and of course, after Zarqawi was killed in 2006, his group morphed into Islamic State or ISIS. But this is not the only Muslim Brotherhood connection to ISIS, of course. In, 2000, in a 2014 interview reported in Al Arabiya, <coughs> the Muslim Brotherhood spiritual guide Yusuf al Qaradawi admitted that the ISIS leader. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi was indeed a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. And of course, several Muslim Brotherhood leaders publicly announced their support for ISIS, including the Qatar-based Sheikh Wagdi Ghanaim, who was famous in Egypt for his TV episode where he was teaching uh, children how to adequately 
uh, decapitate an infidel. After bin Laden's death, Azawahi argued that bin Laden's affiliation with the Muslim Brotherhood was severed in 1980 due to differences over the anti-Soviet Afghanistan campaign. But this claim was discounted by Tarwat al-Khurbawi, the highest ranking Muslim Brotherhood leader to ever defect from the organization. And uh, al-Khurbawi al put out evidence that indeed bin Laden remained a member of the Muslim Brotherhood till the day he died. And after uh, Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood President Hosni Mub uh, Muhammad Mursi was ousted from power in 2013, Zawahri issued a videotape statement on his behalf where he criticized Egyptian Salafi jihadists for not formally joining the Muslim Brotherhood's Freedom and Justice Party to help it uphold Sharia law. Another connection, direct connection between the Brotherhood and Al Qaeda. Furthermore, the, the Muslim Brotherhood secret apparatus remains intact, and in 1995, they founded a new terrorist group called the 95 Brigade which was established in 1995 and it played a critical role in January 2011 riots leading to the downfall of Hosni Mubarak. In a series of interviews with Al Jazeera, Osama Yassin, a former minister in Morsi's cabinet, revealed that members of the brigade, and I quote, engaged in abduction, beating, and torture of thugs and threw Molotov cocktails on their opponents, end of quote. That is very, very, um, that's a force of democratization. That's how I see it, right? <laughs> According to the Brotherhood's own standards and internal bylaws, there are 10 solid, unchangeable thawabit, which are precepts in the organization's baya, which is Islamic Oath of Allegiance process. The fourth of these precepts is violent jihad and martyrdom, according to their documents. And it states that it's an obligation of every individual Muslim, as well as a collective obligation of their organization to engage in jihad and martyr them. Unfortunately, many American specialists, either agents of the Muslim Brotherhood or receive foreign funding from the Brotherhood or otherwise useful idiots or oblivious to the facts, actively engaged in disinformation campaign against the American people. And one example is a Brookings Institute article turned the meaning of the fourth, fourth precept of the Brotherhood's bylaws on its head, stating that it stipulated that, and I quote, during the process of establishing democracy and relative political freedom, the Muslim Brotherhood is committed to ab abide by the rules of democracy and in its inst institutions. I can't read that with a straight face. I, I don't know what to say, I'm speechless. They, how do you turn jihad and martyrdom to uh, uh, a commitment to the rules of democracy? I'm not a Native American speaker, but I don't think that this is the correct translation. <laughs> And thus, you shouldn't be surprised after all this when I tell you that Muslim Brotherhood operatives directly involved with ISIS and Al-Qaeda engage in lobbying 
the United States Congress. For the past four years, Islamists with ties to the Muslim Brotherhood and terrorist groups have gone to Capitol Hill to lobby members of Congress on what they call National Muslim Advocacy Day. It's an annual event organized by CARE, the unindicted co-conspirator CARE, and the U.S. Council of Muslim Organizations, USCMO. According to the Muslim Advocacy Day website, almost 400 participants visit congressional offices. This year, Advocacy Day is scheduled to take place on March 30th and 31st. I published a detailed report about this uh, atrocity in the Middle East uh, forum and it has irrefutable evidence, mostly pictures, and I urge you to check it out. Um, you will be shocked by the information you read in there. But for now, I'm going to give you just a few, very few examples of the wonderful individuals involved in this event. And they mostly, these people reside in New Jersey and New York City. The first of those is the Secretary General of U.S. CMO, Osama Jamal. And Jamal is also the director of the Muslim American Society, Public Affairs and Civic Engagement, Mass Space, a division of Muslim American Society, Mass, which has been identified in court testimony as a front group for the Muslim Brotherhood. Jamal is also the vice president of the Mosque Foundation in Bridgeview, and in 2003, Jamal raised $50,000 at the Mosque Foundation prayer service for terrorist operative Sami al Aryan, the then North American representative of Palestinian Islamic Jihad. And in 2012, under Jamal's leadership, the Mosque Foundation hosted an official delegation of Al Jamal Islamiyya, the Lebanese branch of the Muslim Brotherhood, and the delegation included GI officials who were in direct communication with Hamas and the Iranian uh, Islamic Revolutionary Guard. But it gets worse. The Mosque Foundation also invited Jordanian Islamist Anjam Kursha to give a sermon at the mosque. Kursha was imprisoned in Jordan in 2006 for promoting jihadist propaganda in his lectures. Kursha has defended ISIS members as decent men. The second interesting character is who lobbies Congress is Mazen Mukhtar. He is a U.S. CMO board member and executive director of the Muslim American Society, MASS, and organizer in the Muslim Advocacy Day. In August 2004, the U.S. government accused Mazen Mukhtar of fundraising for Al-Qaeda. Mukhtar allegedly operated a mirror website for Al-Qaeda's Azam.com, which solicited fund and recruits for the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and Chechnyan terror groups. Mukhtar's site was used as backup for Azam.com when it was shut down, until it was shut down after 9-11. The website was also affiliated with Chechnyan terror group, the Islamic Army of the Caucasus, and its field they were also involved with its field commander, Shamil Basayev, who masterminded the Bislam school massacre in Russia, which, where 334 people, including 186 children, were slaughtered. He was basically Al-Qaeda and bin Laden's webmaster. Mukhtar was arrested in 2007 and charged with tax fraud, which investigators hoped to use as an entry point for further terrorism charges. 
but in 2008, then U.S. Attorney Chris Christie inexplicit, inexplicit, sorry, so I'll blame it on the chemo brain. <laughs> dropped charges without an explanation, and today Mukhtar continues to raise fund for Islamic Relief USA, an organization accused with links to Hamas. And if you read my report, you're going to see a lovely selfie of Mukhtar with Senator Cory Booker. Isn't that lovely? That's why I, uh, I, I call him now a Senator Al-Qaeda Selfie Booker. <laughs> and it, it's just managed, they manage, it just gets worse. <coughs> So the third interesting character is a Yemeni-American man called Yahya al-Muntasser, who is a self-proclaimed member of the Muslim Brotherhood. And he's an activist affiliated with a brotherhood group called Egyptian American for Freedom and Justice. And on his Facebook page, because I Cyprus taught these guys, I saw that Muntasser spent several years regularly corresponding with a man called uh, Muhammad Sayyid Taha. Muhammad Sayyid Taha is a self-proclaimed ISIS terrorist. That's how he identified on his Facebook page. And he is currently incarcerated in military prison in Egypt for trying to bomb the police academy in Cairo. Taha referred to al Muntasir, who lobbies Congress, as Ustadi, which is my mentor or my teacher. Al Muntasir, in my opinion, was most probably his recruiter. And he stayed, he is still in prison in what is called um, ISIS big case in Egypt. But of course, it still gets worse, right? Because <laughs> after they got with all they got away with all of that they said heck let's just send a terrorist right like a mass murderer to lobby congress mm -hmm. and they did and um in 2017 a washington-based organization called alliance for egyptian americans brought an egyptian convicted terrorist a new jersey resident and muslim brotherhood operative called ahmed Abdul Basit Muhammad, who's also known as Basit, to meet members of Congress. If you go to his Facebook page, you see uh, page pictures with the late Senator McCain, and it's, it's just wonderful. Uh, and Basit is a physics teacher in the Rising Star Academy in New Jersey. He's teaching American children. Basit was sentenced to death in Egypt, along with seven others, because he was implicated in several terrorist attacks. And he was involved in um, the biggest, uh, one of the biggest, if, if not the biggest, terrorist attack in Egypt, where 506 people were murdered and maimed. And Basset proudly gloated on his Facebook page about his role in this atrocity. But he was in in, in April 2011, uh, he was arrested by ICE, but of course Amnesty International intervened and defended him and called the terrorism charges, which he admitted to on Facebook. Um, they called them um, egregious and grossly unfair. And prior to his arrest, by the way, he was offered a job at Hostess Community College in New Jersey. So you would have had a mass murderer teaching your, your, your children. But months after his incarceration, an immigration judge granted him asylum in the United States, and now he's teaching physics to American children. 
and God knows what else. The example of Bosset is similar to the blind sheikh, the 19 terrorists in 9-11, and I assume there's so many more that we, we can't just mention them all. Now that we're all depressed, <laughs> I'll, I'll finish on a positive note. And I, I, a lot of people mock me when I say that there is a solution for is to deal with Islamic terrorism. And uh, I got a, a lot of ridicule for it. But, w you know, we do not need to invent the wheel. Because like we have touched upon the history of the Muslim Brotherhood terrorists, American history is filled with glorious, heroic successes that we need to be not only proud of, but use as a manual. And I'm going to give you an example on how to destroy Islamist aggression from the history of the United States. During the early shaping of the American spirit, American fought two wars for her sovereignty from Islamist aggression. The first war was in 1803, and this war was lost. And it wasn't until the second war, war of, 19, of 1815 that America's victory granted her independence and safety from Islamist aggression until 1979. Over 200 years ago, the U.S. made the first attempt to fight an overseas battle to protect its private citizens by building an international coalition against what historians call an unconventional foe of pirates and piracy. Yet there is no existence of these terms in Arabic literature when, because Arabic literature describes it as Muslim, milit mi mi Muslim militants and jihadists. While America was still shaping her sovereignty and strategy, a successful foreign policy and, and successful foreign policy, President George Washington and President George Adams both paid jizya, which is infidel ransom tax, to North Amer North African Ottoman colonies especially to the rule uh, to the day of uh, uh, of Algier, Algiers currently which is currently Algeria and Tripoli in Libya which is understandable because he had a lot in his hand and given the national international circumstances it made sense at the time that they would follow the european foreign policy tradition at the time but as early as 1785, the Congress followed the status quo of paying $80,000 in jizya tax to the Ottomans. Thomas Jefferson and John Adams began the process of negotiating with Algerians until, while they were negotiating with the Algerians, they captured two American ships. A year later, and the ruler of Algiers held the crew of 21 people for a ransom of nearly $60,000. Jefferson wrote to Adams in July 11, 1786, saying, paying tribute will merely invite more demands. And when Jefferson became president in 1801, he refused to consent to Tripoli's demand of an immediate payment of half of, of two hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars as an annual a, a, and an annual payment of twenty-five thousand dollars. The Pasha of Tripoli then declared war on the United States, and on October thirty-first, eighteen o one, the USS Philadelphia frigate 
ran aground <coughs> on uncharted reef near Tripoli Harbor, and after a failed attempt to refloat the ship, she was captured and the crew was imprisoned by Tripoli's forces and they were enslaved by the Pasha. The Philadelphia, the Philadelphia was refloated by her captors and displayed as a trophy. But how do you think the heroic founding fathers dealt with that situation? Do you think maybe they asked, what difference does it make? <laughs> do you think? I, 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 don't, I don't think so, because you're not speaking Arabic, and the lovely ladies here are not in burqa. <laughs> so that didn't happen. Um, the, the, the response was, the United States retaliated by capturing the um, a Tripoli uh, catch called Mastico and renamed her Intrepid, but it's, that's a pretty cool thing, but it, but it gets better. On the evening of February 16, 1804, and uh, in the guise of a ship in distress, Intrepid was sailed by 80 volunteers. Most of them were Marines under the leadership of my hero, whoops, Lieutenant Stephen Decatur. <coughs> Decatur and his men audaciously stormed the shores of Tripoli and set ablaze the Philadelphia, denying its use to the Corsairs and its display as a trophy. And in 1815, President Madison directed military forces for the Second War in 18, oh, in, uh, I already said that, where the U.S. defeated the Ottoman Empire, the war brought an end to the, Ameri to the American practice of paying tribute, or jizya ransom, to Islamic State, and marked the beginning of the end of piracy or marine jihad, which has reigned and has been rampant since the 16th century. Just like that, it was gone. And that's why we do not need to reinvent the wheel. We have heroic examples from American history on how exactly to fight against Islamic aggression. And in August 1816, President James Madison sent a letter to the Dey of Algiers and he said, it is a settled policy of America that as peace is better than war, war is better than tribute. The United States, while it wishes war with no nation, it will buy peace with none. Thank you.
Muslim communities in the West are different <coughs> Muslim communities in the Middle East and Africa. Try to repeat it in a short <laughs> How do you divide the Muslim Brotherhood and its extremism from the traditional Muslim perspective? In other words, how do you defeat political Islam without positioning yourself as anti <coughs> Well, m Muslims are, are know better than anyone else the difference between Islamism, terrorists, and regular religious Muslims. Uh, they know that. Uh, in 20, I, I can't remember the exact date, but in 2012, Gallup poll uh, pegged support of uh, of Muslims to the uh, um, uh, for the Muslim Brotherhood among and care among American Muslims at twelve percent. It's only twelve percent of American Muslims that support care or even think it represents Muslims. So yes, is there a vacuum? Yes, there is a vacuum. But America has free laws, and anyone who wants to build an alternative, they can easily do so. I don't think that designating the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization is a good enough excuse um, that it would uh, radicalize regular Muslims. If someone would be radicalized by that, they're already radical. Yes, you comment. There was a point you made a little while ago about how Brookings Institute uh, put out an article very uh, favorable to the Brotherhood. And just using that as a launch point for the question, um, the Brookings Institute is one of these major think tanks that everybody thinks is basically centralized in America, like RAND, that the Qataris call their aircraft carriers because they so heavily invested in them that they, and they make it clear they invest in these, these Brookings and RAND as their aircraft carriers to get the United States to institute their policies thinking they're getting this from traditionally center-left or center-right organizations. The question I have is, in this regard, is Turkey, Gutter, and Iran are, are acting together in many respects right now. Mm. The, the CARE and the USC CMO are acting in a direct relationship with AKP, Turkey. So you can make an argument that the Brotherhood of America is under the operational control of Turkey. A very clear, yes. uh, a very fact-based argument in that regard. Uh, can you speak to that situation, you know, ranging from the Brookings Institute that has nothing to do with the Brotherhood, of course it does, that they're, they're, at the, time the Brotherhood operates on one level, the Persian Gulf states are just flooding the United States with special interest groups at, at 100 to 1 levels of money for spending for their influence campaign. Well, thank you for your comment. They're absolutely spot on. And uh, if you go to the Middle East uh, Forum's website and read the report that I wrote about the Muslim advocacy day, you will actually see pictures of the head of US CMO with Erdogan. More than one picture. So they're heavily involved uh, with Turkey. They're heavily involved with Qatar. And I believe the solution is they need to be uh, registered as foreign aids, the Brookings Institute and, and all, all these entities that are working as agents for foreign hostile governments to the United States. I think that's the way it should be done. about the constitution of Egypt. Uh, is it, uh, what does it have to say about Islam? And to what extent does the Muslim, Muslim Brotherhood use the Egyptian co uh, constitution to justify what it does? And do you have any differences in your interpretation? Well, the constitution of Egypt is, uh, has a lot of problems because the first article states that uh, Egyptian laws should be based on Islamic jurisprudence, so it's basically a constitutional theocracy. And that is something that was put in the Constitution 1971 by President Anwar Sadat, who was also a member of the secret apparatus of the Muslim Brotherhood. Prior to 1971, 
that didn't that was not the case Sharia law was nowhere near the Constitution so of course it does um, play into the broader picture of the Muslim Brotherhood but they as an organization in Egypt are incredibly incredibly unpopular and weak so maybe like two members left there that support them it's really really bad for them um, so yes the Constitution needs a lot of work and it's going to be a very tough battle um, but they need to fight it Thank you, McDonald, from the Institute on Religion and Democracy. Thank you so much, Cynthia. That was terrific. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, uh, you talked about the infiltration. Um, for years, you know, we had the resistance from Islam saying, oh, we're not persecuting people because, you know, I, I worked on advocacy for persecuted Christians. Mm -hmm. Now the, the way they, they're doing it has changed. They're coming into the religious freedom movement mm -hmm. and taking it over, basically, sucking up all the oxygen in the room. Um, you talked about using the example um, from the past with the Marines and the, uh, the pirates uh, as a way to overcome the military kind of Islam. How do we overcome the, um, the victimization part? Well, unfortunately, thank you uh, for being here, Faith. You know, I'm a big admirer of your work. Uh, so the, there are two parts to this problem. First is the general culture that, has, that glorifies the state of victimhood. Mm -hmm. And the Brotherhood is taking huge advantage of that. Um, they're playing on all the talking points of the radical far left and, 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 and that's a problem. But at the same time, um, I believe the way to, to pull the rug from under their feet is to consistently expose them. I never say the word care without mentioning that they're an unindicted co-conspirator in the biggest terrorism case in US history. They need to be constantly held accountable of who they are, what they stand for, their general mission shouldn't be allowed to sugarcoat stuff and then we sit there and just take it. Uh, so they should, and also I believe the Muslim, if the Muslim Brotherhood is designated as a terrorist organization, all these subversive groups that are associated with it, that will really, really hurt them. And that will open the scene for moderate Muslims to take charge. I get countless, literally countless messages of Muslims. Do you know what they say? Thank you for doing this because we're afraid. Do you know what happens? They get beaten up at mosques controlled by the Muslim Brotherhood. And they get death threats. Uh, they, uh, they are terrorized. Muslim Americans who are opposed to terrorism are victims. These are the real victims. And when the United States government says enough is enough, these guys will be able to take control as we want them to. There are a couple of points you uh, made which surprised me that the three officers came out of the earlier Muslim Brotherhood because down the road, Nasser kept the Muslim Brotherhood in jail and hanged Sayyid the Dope and the others. And the other point you made was that the Brotherhood borrowed philosophy from the assassins, which suggests an amalgamation of Sunni and Shia, which is, seems to be rather novel. Oh, these are great questions. Thank you very much. But uh, yeah, but as I said that the rift between Nasser and the Muslim Brotherhood in 1965 was not ideological at all. It was because he asked uh, the Supreme Guide of the Brotherhood to dismantle the secret apparatus because Nasser's uh, reasoning was, we came to power, I'm now controlling the military, what do you need it for? So that was the point of contention. The Brotherhood's traditional, the, the uh, wing, that the non-military wing uh, believed at the time 
that the free officers should hand them power. They should give uh, power to uh, and presidency to the Muslim Brothers. So that's when the rift started. And when they attempted to assassinate Nasser to take control of the country in 1965, that's why Sayyid Qut was executed in 1966. So they were allies. Second question is fantastic, of course. Um, and uh, they were inspired, and, and these are their own words, that's not my analysis or opinion. Uh, the own words of Ali al Ashmawi, a co founder of the Muslim Brotherhood and a founder of the secret apparatus. He's the one who wrote in his biography that early on they were inspired by the Shia Ismaili assassins and modeled their group after them. And the relationship between Sunnis and Shias is not a conventional one. Uh, it's hard to understand from a Western epistemological um, viewpoint because let me tell you, there's a saying in Arabic that says, my brother and I are against my cousin, and my cousin and I are against a stranger. So there has been uh, episodes of collaboration between Sunnis and Shias that date way back, even few days after the Prophet of Islam was uh, da died before his burial, when they started work and when they started fighting over who should be his successor, whether if, if it, it's, it's, uh, it's Ali or Amr ibn Khattab, the same time they decided to put their war aside and after Omar told Ali, I'm going to set your house on fire, they collaborated to fight uh, what we call the wars of Ridda, which is the wars of apostasy. They have collaborated for the past 14 centuries. Let me give you an example. Uh, when Khomeini visited Egypt in 1935, guess where was his first destination? The Muslim Brotherhood's office. He met with Hassan al-Banna in 1935. <laughs> this is a project that has, uh, and you'll read it in my book, there's a whole chapter about that. Um, who, who, who considered the Jafarite uh, sect, Shia sect, as a fifth sect of Sunni Islam? It was Al-Azhar University, uh, a Sunni entity. So there, it's, not, it's not black and white at all. Uh, Qasim al-Sulaimani, who just died, was in Egypt in 2013 training Muslim Brotherhood militants to start a besiege force. Uh, I, I can give you numerous examples of, of the collaboration. Traditionally, uh, they are financed by um, sheikhs and princes and emirs from Saudi Arabia. Uh, now Saudi is, is going through a huge reform, and they almost, it, it, it almost stopped. Right now, the main funding is coming from Qatar. And um, they are, uh, and also a little bit of it is coming from Turkey, the Turkish government, and Iran as well. So that's where, and of course, charities, mm -hmm. charities in the United States and Europe. Yes. 
that is why he was himself uh, was killed. Uh, as a matter of fact, there are a lot of resources available for them still running, even in the United States. You, you can find a lot of mosques, preachers, a lot of preachers, even in the jails. The jails, the American jails, are a source of generating a, a new terrorists. You are overlooking uh, what is going in teaching. Uh, you, you mentioned some uh, professors uh, that teach our children the, 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 the principles. They are in, in jails, in schools, in universities. And at last, we have sub the United States government support a lot of terrorist uh, supporting government especially Turkey. Turkey was the main, <laughs> the main boss of the fighters in Oregon to ISIS, who uh, support the, the supply, <coughs> the continuous supply of fighters, <coughs> weapons, and, and money to ISIS, <coughs> except through Turkey and Qatar. And so the, the, I don't know what is the deep power authority in the United States are supporting such things. Probably they started <coughs> to fight the uh, uh, Soviet Union and is then support the United States. Yes, Mr. Chairman. A few years ago, when President Sisi took power in Egypt, he went to address the entirety of the senior officers and professors of uh, Al-Azhar and made what some of us consider to be a dramatic uh, statement and uh, the challenge to people in the room. I was also, so I was very struck by that. I was also very struck by the reaction in the West. It, it, I thought it was a non-reaction. Yeah. Uh, very much, but do you agree with that? And, and how would you analyze or characterize or, or attribute the reasons for, for the reaction, reactions in the West? Well, the reactions in the West is basically they have picked a side. Mm. And uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not the side of uh, persecuted Christians, uh, moderate Muslims, and enlightened people in the Middle East. When uh, I'll give you an example in 2011, October 9th, 2011, I was I was still in Egypt, and I was supposed to participate in a protest uh, for religious freedom with a, with a, with friends of mine, and I went uh, I, and I, I was supposed to go, but I got a fever this day, and then I told my friends you can go and then come over, have dinner with me in my house and what happened that day was uh, my friend got shot execution style and military uh, vehicles uh, crushed him and uh, severed his, almost severed his legs and uh, almost 30 people were killed in the most gruesome vicious way possible and the how did American press deal with it in President Obama President Obama made a statement at the time where he said, I urge all sides to restrain themselves. That was a signal to the Muslim Brotherhood, slaughter them, kill them on TV cameras, and will continue to funnel political support and money to you. So that's the side that a lot of politicians, unfortunately, are on. And Hence, I had to flee for my life uh, to the United States. So this is, uh, this is unfortunately the case. If, if you remember uh, when Stalin was committing his atrocities, Walter Duranty of the New York Times wrote a very nice article about Stalin. So apparently, Walter Duranty is all over the media right now. 
And uh, uh, as far as uh, what uh, uh, Sisi said, the other, I think it was historic. Uh, he is the only uh, Muslim leader in history in 14 centuries to criticize the theology concept of the women jihad, which is perpetual jihad. This has never happened before. And he is um, starting, he funded um, from Egyptian taxpayer money the rebuilding of churches that the Muslim Brotherhood destroyed. He has collaborated with the most um, moderate Muslims, even the name Mu'tazala Muslims uh, in Egypt. So I think, I think very good things are happening. Uh, first, thank you very much for your presentation. So my question is, um, you know, a lot of us in the, in the study uh, some areas were very surprised when Morsi was elected. I'm sorry, so I can't hear you. Very when uh, Morsi was elected, uh, a lot of us were kind of surprised. So my question is, uh, can you describe from your, please give some insight on how the Muslim Brotherhood uh, put forth to, to ensure that Morsi had the best chance of getting elected because a lot of people say he was democratically elected by the people of Egypt at that time. So, can you give the different ways the Muslim Brotherhood ensure that that happened, and maybe what was the most effective technique that they used? Thank you. Uh, well, thank you for your question. And he didn't. He was not uh, elected at all. Um, Hamad Morsi was a prison at SKP, uh, and uh, he was mentally challenged. Actually, he had literally he had a lobotomy. That's not something that's widely known, but he did have a lobotomy. Um, so he's got a lot of, he had a lot of health issues. And uh, there's a, I wrote at the time a few articles with Dr. Daniel Pipes, the president of the Middle East Forum, proving with evidence, overwhelming evidence that it was a sham election and that he was installed by uh, Brotherhood operatives in the Egyptian army and he was not elected. My pleasure. All right, well, I take a backseat to no one in my admiration of Stephen Decatur. I wonder how practical that solution is about uh, uh, you know, setting forth the Marines to go battle uh, the Egyptian Brotherhood. I wonder if there's some other historical examples that might be more on point. Specifically, have you looked at the denazification that was yeah. done after World War II? A couple of salient points emerge from that. One. German think tanks and charitable organizations were banned from taking money from overseas, yes. even neighboring France. If you look at the funding for a lot of these front groups in Europe and the United States, they receive a tremendous amount of money from the Gulf, from Iran, from Turkey, and elsewhere. Secondly, they had to swear an oath of loyalty to the democratically elected government of Germany, which obviously they could swear an oath to the United States. That shouldn't be a problem for them. And they had to renounce violence. The other thing the U.S. did for denazification is actually finance think tanks, which exist to this day, for example, the Friedrich Nam Stiftung, to invite intellectuals into debates and present a series of counter ideas to actually debate these extremist ideas and defeat them. We know from the prison debates in Cairo and to a lesser extent in Yemen that when these ideas are debated, the radical Islamists actually know very little about the Quran and their ideas quickly fall apart. Why do you not advocate a similar approach here? Well, I, I apologize for the misunderstanding. I, when I was talking about the Stephen Decatur uh, thing, I, was in, I didn't mean that the Marines will storm the shores of the Mediterranean. And that's not, I thought it was a metaphorical of, uh, if I can use Osama bin Laden's wo words, it's the strong horse versus the weak horse. And it's the strong horse approach where you do not uh, compromise with your enemy because this is death. When the Muslim Brotherhood uh, um, and Mubarak's regime abducted my brother in Tahrir Square and they made me listen to him get tortured so that I can compromise, guess what I did? I refused to compromise. That's what I mean by the Decatur solution. That's what I mean by the medicine solution. Because if I had compromised, 
And if I said, oh my God, I'll do everything you want, he would have been killed. He came later, he came an hour later back home with his jaws shattered, but he was alive. And that's what I mean by the Decatur solution, is that you do not negotiate with terrorists, you do not become submissive to them, because it only invites more aggression. That's what I meant. And I do believe in the Nazification um, solution, and I actually have written extensively about this in Egyptian media. Um, so, yeah, we don't really disagree. Thank you.